to episode three of Gar Boris's Time Machine. And along with me, as usual, is your host, Gar Boris. Um, today, Gar, we're going to continue um, part two of episode three. And last time we were talking about um, movies and TV shows from the 1960s there. Today, we're going to get into um, music and maybe um, some of the toys that, from that time period. So um, right off the bat, um, I want to go down this list I made of some of the popular music acts from that time. And then we can kind of get into this. Um, just to go down the list, there's about 26 acts here. Number um, one was Elvis Presley. Number two, Brenda Lee. Three, Chubby Checker. Four, Ray Charles. Um, number five, Lawrence Welk. Number six, The Four Seasons. Number seven, Stevie Wonder. And then we have The Beatles, um, The Beach Boys, Dean Martin, The Supremes, Bobby Vinton, The Temptations, The Rolling Stones, The Dave Clark Five, Simon and Garfunkel, The Mamas and the Papas, The Turtles, The Monkees, Aretha Franklin, Otis Redding, Marvin Gaye, Herb Albert, um, The Fifth Dimension, um, at number 25, The Doors, and finally at number 26, um, Jimi Hendrix. Now let me ask you, um, uh, going down that list, um, a lot of artists on that list, um, what's the first thing that automatically kind of pops out at you? The, the hippie stuff, the mamas and the papas, and uh, I mean the 60s was the uh, decade uh, most dominated uh, by the hippie generation. It just seems yeah. to be the hippie, uh, the hippie movement because it, it didn't just it, it infected almost everything, and I don't mean infected in a in a bad yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, better, uh, I think a better term would be influence. There you go, there you go. Uh, because it, it just seemed, well, I mean, I, I hold infection in a more dearly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, uh, But it yeah. influenced everything. It influenced music. It influenced uh, TV. It influenced fashion. It influenced uh, virtually everything. It influenced how people talked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so true. I mean, um, first thing I know is going down that list of, of artists is just just uh, the diversity in music back then. I mean, um, the fact that you could have, you know, a, a Chubby Checker, um, the Beatles, um, the Rolling Stones, um, you know, the Supremes. I mean, the artists, or even, even Lawrence Welk at that time. The thing I remember about Lawrence Welk when I was a kid is, um, you know, I, 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 um, I was born, like I said, 1971, but by my first kind of uh, recollection of uh, Lawrence Welk was... My grandmother used to um, love to watch him on TV and his orchestra, and um, and, and Lawrence Welk, believe it or not, at the time, it was it was all over TV. Um, I remember people buying records in the record store of it. I mean, I was a Lawrence Welk fan, but again, that's my reference point. That used, going over to my grandparents' house, my grandmother used to love to watch it on TV. It's just you know, when you stop and think back back then, you know, you could hear everything, um, like from an Elvis Presley to the Beatles, the Beach Boys, you know, all. Um, and sometimes even like uh, Jimi Hendrix and Starman Gar Garfunk all on the same radio station back then. Well, I my recollections of about Lawrence Welk was the same as what you just described. Yeah, yeah, except yeah. For uh, I, I kind of always dreaded. Yeah, 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 yeah. To visit my grandparents because of that, because yeah. I was so much more influenced by what was going on with the younger generation. Uh, yeah. Generation yeah. that to go over and and watch that which was really really popular with the older generation yeah yeah, yeah. it was kind of boring for me so i yeah, uh, yeah. you know just just the thought of sitting there for however long we're gonna uh be at my grandparent and just having that being dominated by watching Lawrence yeah yeah Welk, and Lawrence, it was yeah. not something i looked forward to lawrence Welk, I, I bring that only up because like i said uh i mean that's kind of my reference point for Lawrence Welk, and it's kind of interesting as a historian to go back in history and kind of think. I, I, I dare say that you know Lawrence Welk probably was um, probably the most popular orchestra. I mean, uh, at that time or since, because I mean, you don't have people these days lining up to get um, you know recorded um, recorded pieces of music by orchestras. It's just not a popular thing like it was back then. <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, it, it, you know, you know, for, 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 you know, my grandparents and, and, you know, all of that, deal. you know, they, yeah. they, they, they absolutely loved yeah, that, yeah. but I did, I, you know, I wanted to, you know, <laughs> you wanted to rock. Yeah. Who didn't? Yeah, yeah. You know, even, even as a kid, uh, back in those days, you know, I even gravitated towards 
uh, you know, the 60s music uh, that I gravitated towards was some of the, uh, what you would call, you know, by today's standards, yeah. it's, it's, you know, very tame. But back in the 60s, it was considered more of the harder driving rock. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, the actual term garage band came from the 1960s because it was a term uh, for a type of uh, music that was going on uh, back in those days, uh, which was, you know, kind of simple chord, hard, uh, what you would call power chord, oh, yeah, hard yeah. driving, simple uh, rock, you know, driving uh, music, uh, which eventually uh, became punk. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. But in the '60s, it was called garage rock, and um, you know, be, you know, basically, of course, you know, because everybody would be thinking about, you know, the bands, you know, would always be practicing in somebody's garage. Yeah, yeah. You know that that kind of a thing. But there was there were there were bands like the Seeds. I don't think anybody remembers. But there was a song that they came out with. They were probably like a one-hit wonder. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But uh, it was called "You're Pushing Too Hard." Oh, I got uh, that. I loved that song back in the '60s as a kid. And then there's "You Really Got Me" by the Kings. Yeah, that's another one. Uh, yeah. Another simple power chord, hard driving rock song. And it, it just seemed that even back then, when you know, when I was a kid. Um, you know, because this is my preteen uh, years yeah, yeah, yeah. back in the '60s, and I was even gra gravitating towards the harder stuff back then too. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is that's kind of what jumped out at this um, list of popular music acts. I was uh, just going down of the, from the 1960s. If you go down this list, probably the heaviest two um, acts on here would be the doors and Jimi hendrix and that kind of predates a lot of the bands that you and i would grow up listening to like a lot of these hard rock and metal bands it, i mean really at the time in the 60s the the hardest music out there was probably like the doors and hendrix you know well even previous to the you know because the doors and hendrix didn't kind of hit 12 towards the second half of the, of the 60s. 60s yeah yeah i'm just saying but, but yeah previous that, yeah. to that there yeah. were there were hard driving uh, bands like the day Dave Clark Five, oh, yeah, which is yeah, uh, yeah. a British band, and when you listen to their music, it was uh, very driven by the rhythm section. Very dri Dave Clark was the drummer of the band. Oh yeah, and yeah. so it was very uh, heavily uh, driven uh, music. So, so even you know before Jimi Hendrix, there were predecessors that kind of led up to music becoming because you know basically I don't know I think I probably said it before in another interview. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's two guitarists um, that you know stand up above all of the rest. Um, not necessarily, you know. Because you know you could say that they're better, yeah. or, but they what they did was they changed how guitar was being played. Uh, because you had guitar playing before Jimi Hendrix, of course, of course, yeah, and then you had how much it had drastically changed Levitating. after Jimi Hendrix, yeah, yeah, yeah. And back in his time when uh, when he hit. Uh, that was considered heavy metal. You That's know, what I'm that saying. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't get any harder than that. Until Black Sabbath, and, um, maybe. Yeah. You know, but but he literally changed the how sound. guitar was being played. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, what, you know, 50 years later, we He's, look back and, it, yeah. and uh, it's it's easily recognized that his music was heavily blues. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very much <laughs> yeah. heavy, heavy yeah, yeah. on the blues. But at the time when he was uh, out there, nobody was really thinking of it as blues. Yeah, the only other thing on there, too, I think, from that time that kind of, um, that has kind of elements of hard rock uh, would be the Rolling Stones, because the Rolling Stones, I think you would agree, is much more rooted in blues, but there's, um, like, if you're into hard rock music, there's elements of, of that and what the Stones do as well. 
Well, and a lot of people don't know this, but actually Led Zeppelin started in in the late 60s. I think they started maybe about 68. I believe so, yeah. 68, yeah. 69. Yeah. And when you listen to their first album, uh, that's heavy, heavy on the blues. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, much more so than like when they'd get into the bigger um, radio hits and stuff. But yeah, a lot of that stuff um, is just rooted in the blues, you know? Yes, yes. So, you know, it's it's funny because, that, you know, I, I just have to point out, but, you know, because when you, you know, when you were there in the 60s, yeah. you didn't think of that as blues. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you really didn't. But now you, you know, you can hear you're it. able to, you know, you're 50 years and then looking back, it's so obvious yeah, you, how yeah. heavy, heavily laden in that music blues is. It's almost like just put on those old Zeppelin records and you can hear the evolution of Zeppelin, you know, through the records. I mean, um, mm-hmm. and maybe you couldn't at the time, but like you said, and then you even stop and think that um, before you get to Led Zeppelin, the Yardbirds, which is really heavily um, in the blues, um, which also featured, um, you know, I think Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page at one point. So um, <laughs> that, that band spawned Jeff Beck, yeah, yeah. Eric Clapton, and uh, Page. <laughs> one, yeah. Jimmy Page. Yeah, yeah. Three of, so, you know, considered some of the greatest guitarists, you know, in, in you know, of yeah. all time for rock. Yeah. And they all came out of that one band. And it's just kind of kind of trippy to, you know, to think of that because uh, nobody remembers anybody else that was in that band. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people are always <laughs> citing um, like Jimmy Page. But I, I will tell you, to me, um, Eric Clapton, I mean, he's a super huge talent in the sense, not only a great guitar player and songwriter, but great frontman, great singer. He can kind of he's one of those guys that can kind of do it all. And he did not just have um, like a huge um, successful solo career. I mean, before even he um, went solo, he had success in a couple other bands, Cream, um, Derek and the Domino. So, you know, he's been around for, you know, 50 plus years at, at least. And um, and he's had quite a bit of success almost in everything he's ever done, you know. Well, he was the number one influence on Eddie Van Halen. He, yeah. You know, Eddie, you know, when he was in his formative years, uh, that was who Eddie Van Halen used to hold in an extremely high regard. Yeah. Um, you know, but but both Eddie Van Halen and Jimi Hendrix, you know, there's guitar playing, how guitar play, was played yeah. before them, and then since, and then, and then there's uh, how guitar was played since then. Yeah, you know, and uh, those are the two guitarists to me that really stand out among all of these great guitars. Yeah. Now, you know, to to sit there and say you know which one's better is an opinion, it's oh, a so personal true. preference thing. You can't say that one is, is better. Once you reach yeah. that level, they yeah. are all great yeah and then talking about you know I mean? yeah talking about eddie van halen i mean there's no arguing the guy was i mean he was king and what he, he was just great at what he did but when you stop and think that um i've read stuff like for example that the guy could not um read a lick of music but but yet look at what he was able to do with the guitar see it's not it's not always necessarily um the most important thing to play technically precise the fact that eddie could not read a lick of music it did not matter because people just love what well, he was, uh, I don't know how to read music, and I've... Yeah, yeah, see? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, never, yeah. you know, yeah. the, only, I, the only lessons I ever took yeah. was my, you know, back in the 60s, uh, my, my cousin Frank, uh, you know, stayed, you know, I shared my room with him because his parents... Yeah. Uh, were looking for a house when they were, you know, they were military family and they were moving out here. And in the meantime, before they found a house, my cousin Frank stayed with me. Yeah. And I knew he had, he knew how to play guitar, and I just had this strong desire to learn how to play guitar. And yeah. And I drove my cousin nuts. I bet. I, I literally drove Frank nuts trying to squeeze because he barely he really didn't know that much himself yeah yeah you know he didn't know how to play chords and you know it, it, it was just what what little he knew was was very rudimentary yeah 
but it was enough. It was enough for me to get a foothold in the music. Uh, to be able to build off of. That's cool. And yeah. if it wasn't for my cousin Frank, who knows what you'd be uh, doing? <laughs> doing that, I I wouldn't be here right now. So yeah. uh, you know, but that's it. You yeah. know, he didn't show me how to read. He didn't show me how. To, all he really did is he showed me how to tune a guitar. Yeah. How you know how to tune it without a reference point. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know where where you know E is on the piano or yeah, yeah, A yeah. is on the piano uh, without. A, but just you know, just so when you're actually playing the instrument, it's actually in tune. Wow! Wow! That's all yeah. he showed me how to do, and and a couple of very 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 simple things uh, that were not really co- you know chords. Uh, they were more just you know just kind of like a small simple melodies and, oh, wow. and things like that they were they were based in uh parts of surf songs because back in the oh, wow. 60s Dig Dale. surf yeah. songs yeah. yeah that was uh, and and one of, uh I, i'm not sure if it was by dick dale but yeah. one of them was called turnpike okay um and that was one of the, you know, things that my, you know, cousin, it wasn't that part. That's the lead part. He played, he showed me how to do the rhythm part, which was very repetitive. And that's all I learned how to do was just the rhythm part. That yeah, you know, do, 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 wow. that you play the, the main part over. So yeah. it was very simple and very rudimentary, but it was, it was, um, it was enough for me to actually, you know, get an idea of what's actually going on on a guitar and, and how, uh, you know, how these melodies, you know, your finger goes here and you pluck yeah, this yeah. string, your finger goes there and you pluck that string and, you know, very rudimentary, but it's, it was enough for me to get the whole ball. But after that, Everything else I had I had taught myself. Amazing, and, and you know I'm glad you brought up Dick Dale because on this he's not even included on this list. Amazingly, and um, and often um, the group that was also big and that came along in the '60s was very big at the time was um, the Beach Boys. They often get credited for um, you know kind of creating that surf rock thing. But I I, I dare agree with you that um, you know Dick Dale even um, he's really the one that should be credited because he he really predates the Beach Boys even you know. Oh, you know, he does, and you know, it, you know, he was, uh, you know, there was it, those songs uh, that he popularized didn't even have lyrics or didn't even yeah, have yeah. singing and they, going they, on. They stuck in it, your head, you know, though. The focal point was the guitar playing. Yeah, and that's it's amazing how those um, those Dick Dale tunes they stick in your head, and, and that is an interesting thing. They didn't even have lyrics, and, and people. We're, we're digging on that. And now, in, in reference to the Beach Boys, what did you think when they came along? Because, I mean, again, they get credited with, you know, um, you know, uh, um, creating surfer music or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, it was kind of different at the time. You know, they were in their beach gear and they had their surfboards and it was just a different type of music. I mean, when you were you much of a Beach Boys fan or what, what, what did you think of them? Well, they were they were getting played on the radio. So, so a you're hearing lot. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so and and you have to admit the songs were very very catchy. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and you know and the and the harmonies were really really cool and really nice. So as far as like a um, you know a soundtrack to the 60s Absolutely. The Beach Boys, you know, uh, were a huge part of that. I mean, when, when, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you always, you always had the radio on when you were doing whatever you were doing yeah, yeah, yeah. through the day. Yeah. You know, you just had the radio on playing uh, playing all of this music while you're working out here doing this or, or doing, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it was always on. And there was always... Um, you know the you know stuff by the Beach Boys and and you know there was just uh, a whole bunch of really really cool uh, yeah. catchy songs that were going on during that time yeah. uh, and it was all being played on the radio so it was just natural to hear all of it uh, I I'm pretty sure my my parents uh, because this is pre FM radio yeah yeah yeah. 
when radio was all AM. And I think my parents pretty much mostly had KRLA, which yeah, eventually, yeah. Uh, you know, became, uh, you know, as I was growing, say back in the 80s when people were listening to KRLA, KRLA was playing music from the 50s. It was always retro, what was retro going on at, at KRLA. But back in the 60s, it wasn't retro. It was what was ever going on currently at that time. And the Beach Boys, I mean, who hasn't heard um, all those great catchy tunes like you're saying? I mean, just, just a couple come to mind, like California Girls, Surfing USA, um, Surfer Girl, um, Help Me Rhonda. Um, there's one even uh, Brian Wilson wrote, I remember, about his... Uh, wife called Barbara Ann and, and that's just a great catchy tune I always love that um you know fun 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 they just had just great little catchy tunes and and at the time of the, the Beach Boys were really a big deal too because they were kind of the American equivalent at the time they people were saying to the Beatles which you know were, were real big because they were coming over here all the way from England and and the and um you know the Beatles there's kind of this thing I remember at the time like you were saying the Beach Boys versus um you know um the beatles and, and then sometimes also the the beatles versus the stone so um well well it, it, actually the the beach boys were the kings of the hill here in the united states yeah, until yeah. the beatles came and then the it beatles kind of took knocked over them off of their pedestal yeah 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 <laughs> i gave them something to and see the beatles were very popular and interesting um group at that time because initially of course they all came with their little short haircuts and they looked like you know everybody's favorite boy next door and everybody's starting dressing like you said and trying to get those kind of haircuts and then a few back years in the, back in the 60s that was considered long hair yeah yeah and then do you by remember today's standards yeah. it's it's short hair yeah and then but back in yeah. the 60s what the, they called them the mop tops yeah yeah and then you remember like by the time they released let it be you know they started really growing their hair long and growing beards and stuff and um that was that, at that time that was considered rebellious so oh, you know they're growing their hair long they're looking really different <laughs> But when they first came to America, that, that suit and tie look that yeah, they yeah. had, that was considered long hair. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. And, you know, um, the Beatles just, I mean, I mean, a thing that stands out to me is, like, I think we're talking about this for, um, I got their number one album, which is, like, um, just uh, stop thinking the Beatles had, like, 27 number one hits. So you get this um, collection, like, their greatest greatest hits ever and you can't really go wrong with any of those tunes on that album like like you're saying very much like with the beach boys every song on that album for example the number ones not only did it go number one but they were popular tunes um tunes that we all love hearing and so the beatles really to me what made them such a great group not just the songs but they were great songwriters and, and you could put on like from one beatle album to the next there was a progression they did not uh, the albums did not all sound the same, and I, I think they that's... They were not repetitive. Yeah, yeah, and that's what made the Beatles really stand out. Even, you know, talking about it, you know, 50 years later, I mean, the Beatles are still relevant in music today. Yeah, yes. I mean, you know, they're, they're just, you know, that, that was a, a big thing because it was a transitional period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, early 60s, most of... Uh, you know, well, 50s and early 60s, most of the uh, artists that were out there had their music written for them by someone else. Uh, but then uh, when the Beatles, uh, you know, started, you know, hitting and 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 uh, uh, the Beach Boys and yeah, that, yeah. that, that was the very beginning of artists actually writing their own material. So it, there, it was a very competitive time uh, amongst uh, you know these these different bands at that time uh, to you know to uh, really really work on your uh, your songwriting abilities and stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean that was the first time when people, I mean, really started to realize that hey, um, there could be more money in this uh, music in this music business thing um, for the artist if we start writing our own music as opposed to covering other um, people's songs, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. There's a lot more money uh, to be made in being the person that writes the actual song. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but you know, there, there was, I, But during that time, you know, I, I, you know, even at that time, I was more, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I loved all of the music during that time, yeah, yeah. but I was more 
gravitating towards the harder stuff. The, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, like wild thing. You make my heart. I love it. I sing. love that. Yeah, you're taking, you make yeah. Yeah, yeah. everything grooving. Mm-hmm. You know, that was yeah. that was the stuff that I was kind of gravitating, and I didn't know it. You know, at the mm-hmm. time that you know, I guess I've been a hard rocker. You know, from yeah. the beginning. Yeah, and I, I know you and I've had a discussion about this before, but um. You know, so like at that time, Jimi Hendrix was probably the closest thing they had to like hard rock or um, even metal. And, and what's interesting is, um, I dare say that um, with the Beatles, I mean, and, and that song, um, you, you know, um, oh, Helter Skelter. That no, that's not a Motley Crue tune, people. They they just covered that's, it. But that's the Beatles. But yes. that's like the start of metal right there. You know, or, or kind of. Well, the, do you know that <laughs> the. Um, the song Helter Skelter before it was ever picked uh, picked up and done by Motley Crue, uh, that was actually uh, adopted by the Charles Manson family as a, as a mantra song. I did not know that. Uh, wow! Thank you for it. Yes. Wow. Uh, if if you kind of do uh, you know, I, I always have yeah. this tendency to go on the dark side. My daughter tells me wow, about wow. this. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's a real dark Thing, corner yeah. of yeah. it, but. Uh, yeah, Charles Manson embraced that song and really uh, gave that song a, a really heavy backlash by society because wow. uh, it was written by the Beatles and it was a very popular song at the time yeah. when the Beatles were doing it. Uh, but then when Charles Manson embraced it and, and wow. it became associated with you know the horrific stuff that uh, did, the yeah. Manson family did, uh, it. It even had a, a huge backlash on the uh, the Beatles. How awful! Yeah, wow, that's that's amazing. And you know, um, um, before we move on, I just wanted a few more to, to kind of spotlight a few more artists on this list. Now, Elvis Presley, he's on this list as far as being one of the most popular acts of the '60s. Elvis really dates back to, I mean, the introduction 50s. to the '50s. But um, see, here's the thing: at the '60s, Elvis was still very much popular at the time. And, and the interesting thing about Elvis is. I think it's important to include him in our discussion today because um, Elvis, even if you go back all the way to the 50s, I mean, he's like the premier rock god. He was um, everybody's idea of what a rock star should be at that time. And a lot of people that would go on to have huge careers kind of model themselves. I, I dare say even like John Bon Jovi after Elvis Presley. Well, you know, but then also, you know, when you take what Elvis was doing back in the 50s, I know this is what we're talking about in the 60s, but what he was doing in the 50s was uh, the predecessor to Rockabilly. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're totally right about that. And um, another guy I want to kind of include here that was also on this list, popular artist um, from the 60s, is Chubby Checker. Now, a lot of people might think of Chubby Checker as like a one-hit wonder. We think of the song The Twist, but... Um, the twist even was a lot more than just a song. I mean, I was reading up on him, and when uh, I mean to go along with the song, they created a dance. You know, the twist, and and he was responsible for creating quite a lot, uh, quite a uh, several different types of dances. You know, if you go down, uh, like just look up on uh, Chubby Checker's Wikipedia, you'd be amazed at all the stuff this guy is crea- uh, credited with creating, which is kind of interesting. That at the time, a guy could be popular not just for kind of. Um, a song he had on the charts but uh, that he wrote but um for creating like a dance to go along with it you know well all of those dance moves that you're talking about yeah 90 percent of them i know how to do amazing amazing yeah you know and I, let, let me see the jerk was super popular yeah that's what i was you reading know, up uh, on yeah the twist uh, the monkey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch of these different dance moves. Uh, you know, the swim. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and the best, the best, uh, you know, uh, uh, reference to all of those dance moves is uh, the the dance scene in uh, Pulp Fiction, uh, because yeah, yeah. virtually every one of those dance moves uh, that uh, Chubby Checker. Uh, no, no, no! In in Pulp Fiction, oh yeah, yeah, uh, the oh. John Travolta Did, and yeah. uh, uh, Sam- God, Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, no, the girl. Oh, okay, the, okay, the dance yeah. scene. Okay, okay. Uh, where they're doing that dance scene? Virtually yeah. every one of those dance moves that they hit him and the and God, I forgot the name of the girl. To, oh, Uma Thurman was it? Uma Thurman. There you go. Both of those. Uh, were those dance moves that you're talking about Amazing. that were popularized uh, 
uh, by Chubby Checker. Amazing, you know? yeah. And uh, th- those were the every single one of those moves that they make in Pulp Fiction are all of the most popular. Wow, wow. From the 60s. And then the final um, act I kind of want to spotlight here that was on this list is the Monkees. Now, the Monkees are often compared to the Beatles and the fact that they all came, they both both bands came from like England. But the interesting thing to me about the Beatles and the uh, Monkees is um, the Beatles, they were actual musicians where I think only two of the guys in the Monkees were actual musicians. Like Davy Jones, before he was ever in the Monkees, he was much more of an actor in England. That's how he got his start. But... Um, they would like, they went on to do like the Monkees TV show and then they'd make music for that that a lot of times other people would write. But what's interesting is, um, again, um, that they, they went on to kind of learn to play their uh, their instruments, um, some of the guys, and they became an actual band. That, that's kind of what the evolution of the Monkees, that's what I kind of dug about that, you know? Well, during the 60s, that show was so, so popular. I, you know, I can't express how popular that show was. Yeah. Everybody was glued to the TV to watch because the show was actually funny. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, they had humor it, to what they did, too. It wasn't just, uh, you, yeah. know, uh, uh, you know, it, there, it was actually a funny comedy show. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and, and just like the, the bands, um, everybody had their fi- favorite member yeah, yeah. of the band. You know, uh, some people would identify with uh, Davy Jones. Other people would... Uh, identify with Mickey Dolenz, and then others would identify with Peter Tor. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, but uh, they that was an extremely funny show. I loved the monkeys, and I, let's put it this way: I even remember, yeah, yeah, who the two songwriters were Amazing. that used to write the songs that became their big hits. Now, Daydream Believer, that's one of the biggest hits besides the monkey theme, and I was reading that that was like the number eight song from 1967, and um, I believe, if I'm correct, um, I believe originally before the monkeys ever recorded, the person that made it famous first was Neil Diamond, of all people. <laughs> songwriters that was writing the songs for the monkeys uh-huh. that all those songs that were big hits were tommy boyce and bobby hart wow wow <laughs> those are the two guys that wrote for the monkeys yeah yeah and um you know that if you if you look there it was always their two names on you know oh, as the it, songwriters yeah, yeah. credits for all of those songs and last train to clarksville and you know, it's they had a ton of songs that became very, very popular. And you I know, mean, yeah. really super popular songs. And I got to tell you, I, I remember kind of getting into the Monkees, like in my teenage years. Like I said, you got to keep in mind, I, I wasn't born until uh, July 4th, 1971. And, and the Monkees were a thing way before, before I ever came into the world. But here's the interesting, I remember when... Like, being a teenager at the time, and MTV started playing all these old episodes of a Monkees TV show. It became a popular thing again because it was on MTV. And Yeah, by the time you got to it, it was a retro thing. Yeah, exactly. But it, 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 what, what amazes me is, even though that's kind of how I got into the Monkees, um, what was cool about it is, um, all these years later, the, 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 um, the music was still just as cool to me probably as when, as when you were first discovering it. And it didn't oh, matter. It, it was great. It was, you know, it just it was all brand new at the time, and and there was just uh, such a craze. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the monkeys, you know, it's just a. Uh, and it, know, it didn't even I, matter, like you're saying, that other people wrote the music. I mean, because I I think um, what the monkeys proved um, that you could be success uh, success at is, um, um, I mean, the British. I mean, they're really famous for two things. Music and comedy, I mean, and, and the monkeys kind of, they just had both of that, you know, and it didn't matter. Like, like when you had the big controversy about Millie Vanilli, it didn't, you know, um, it, the monkeys never got any, any kind of controversy. Oh, other people writing the music or they don't, they're, they're just, you know, hired musicians. It, it didn't matter. They, they were the face. They were the voice, so to speak. And, and even like you're saying, the monkeys were so popular one time that, um, in the seventies, Davy Jones even gets to make an appearance on the Brady Bunch. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
another great show. You know, I mean, uh, you know, th- this is this is uh, all kinds of stuff that that I grew up on. You know, and you know, was fortunate enough to see it when it was brand new. Yeah, yeah. and it was first being introduced. Uh, you know, to everybody, and it, and, and it was a really kind of an exciting time you know it's kind of trippy to look yeah. back because yeah. uh most people that are younger that they didn't really grow up during yeah. that time uh the only thing that i can say uh to to try to help people to visualize is is um and it's gonna it's hard to visualize because you have to take what you're experiencing now so and what it was then, then yeah. And go 50 years in the future and then look back. Yeah, and, and see, the monkeys at. even, the monkeys, like, like I said, they would often get compared to the Beatles. And, um, but, but, but I dare say, like, um, there's really nothing been like the monkeys since, I dare, since they came on the scene or, or you know, before them. I mean, um, probably the closest thing you get to is maybe the Beatles. And the Beatles, I think, were a little more um, successful. But, but definitely, I, I would say the monkeys have their place in the. Uh, music history now let me ask you being a guy that's seen these shows and they originally aired um like would you tune in each week and you kind of get to check out a new song or by that point you'd see the the tv show where the, the album's already out well it, you know this is kind of at the very beginning because yeah. eventually in the 70s what all of this developed into was you uh go buy an album you yeah. read you released the album and then you went on tour yeah 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 and then <laughs> when people would go see you on tour they would see you perform that music on wow. that album live yeah yeah and then get excited and go out and buy the album uh, yeah. so touring facilitated the purchase yeah. of buying the album yeah i mean even um, yeah even as a kid in the 70s 80s i, I remember picking up like circus magazine and and bands bands would not back in the day um even go on tour until the new album was released they wouldn't even think of it you know right <laughs> yeah. but the 60s was kind of where all of that whole system was being developed yeah yeah it, it really hadn't been developed and so you know i mean you, you i what they were doing is is they would be performing on the TV show, yeah. and then they started realizing, oh my gosh, this the, the, the public is eating this up. Yeah. If we put out an album, they'll eat up the album. And yeah. then they started releasing albums. Oh, yeah. But I think in the 60s, it, it was more they were kind of discovering, oh my gosh, we can make a whole bunch of money doing this. Yeah, and, and you know? um, yeah. before we move so on... Yeah. It, it, but I think the TV show was just kind of more of, uh, you know, of a uh, precursor to all that. Pre- like. Preconceived, you know, kind of what they did. Uh, do you, uh, back in the seventies, they uh, an example of it was Village People. Okay. Okay. Village People was something that was put together. It was a preconceived, and then they had a whole bunch of people that auditioned. You were going to have, uh, you know, people audition for the guy that dresses up as the, as the cop. Yeah, we're going to yeah. have people that audition for guys. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah, and then yeah, they yeah. would decide which one is going to be which, and it was a whole marketing thing yeah. that was all done, and then it was all put together, but it wasn't a bunch of people that decided, hey, guys, let's put this together. It yeah, was yeah. a preconceived idea yeah. thing and the Beatles I mean and the monkeys was that before it was ever really thought of yeah yeah it, it was yeah it, it was like yeah. the first of those type of con- conceptual things they they were they really didn't care if uh, Davy Jones didn't you know you know mm-hmm. all they really cared about was could they sing yeah that's then, all they really cared yeah. about at that time, uh, because they didn't care if Mickey Dolenz knew how to play drums or not. Yeah, they didn't care yeah, yeah. if Peter Tork knew how to play bass or not. Yeah, you see, know what I mean. That wasn't really yeah. part of it. It was more about them: can they sing or not? Because yeah, yeah. It, everything else was going to be written for them. Yeah, like I, I know the bass player Mike Michael Nesmith. I think he was the one guy in the band that really was a musician before the monkey's yes. lunch and interesting thing about him he came from a, i guess interesting family but his 
his mother is the one that invented Elmer's glue. That's just a little side note there. But um, but but yes, and that's what kind of interesting, like you're saying, they were more actors than musicians. And they what interests me is um, like you had the two guys you said that wrote wrote all the hits. Okay, all, all the songs. And they, it's obvious they couldn't sing, otherwise they would have sung these songs themselves, but they kind of hired this band, they looked the part. And over the course of the, the Monkees' career, they, they actually learned how to play there, so it became an actual band. Yes. And they yes. continued once the TV show was no longer on. Now, um, now uh, before we move on to the second portion of today's show, I had some interesting uh, things I came up with, a um, little thing, interesting notes here. Um, in 1968... The film rating system was introduced. Now, this is a thing where you go to see a movie and um, it's it's rated R, rated you know PG thirteen or whatever the case may be. And and at, so um, come 1968, they they feel that there's a need for for that, and they're going to start rating um, films. And and I was reading part of a reason for that was um, that film you mentioned last time we did this Barbarella that um, when that it film had, came out was, that had a lot to do with it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then also, the, the kind of predates the '60s, right? Right um, at the end of the '50s, 1959. That was the um, first year that the Grammy Awards were, was launched, and and so being that it was launched in 1959, um, for the next decade, it would become a very big thing in the '60s and on. Well, and, and back in those days, it was more uh, legitimate, you know, yeah, yeah, people yeah. that won would be legitimate winners it's kind of like the oscars yeah you know the people in in the early years of the oscars were legitimate you know uh yeah. you know and i think it was even more worthy yeah. you know uh performances and things like that but it, it you know over the years the reason why I, I don't think a lot of people kind of take them as seriously is because uh, there's so much uh, more, kind of, I guess, what you would say, corruption. Oh, I, uh, yeah. So people yeah. are winding, winning, and then and then the rest of us are scratching our heads going, what? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a good example of what you're talking about. I mean, I remember, like, even in the 80s, you, I, I used to always tune in to watch the Grammys because even back then, um, you know, the, the people that won, I'll say, like, um, I remember, like, Madonna and Billy Idol, Michael Jackson went in a ton of... Grammys, you know, when I was coming up, and I could say at least um, they may not have been my favorite artist, but at least I've heard of these people that, that were winning the awards back then. Um, half the people that win, win these awards, I have no idea who they are. I haven't even um, Michael Jackson. I could at least say, okay, I've heard Beat It and um, Thriller and all that, but you know, Billie Jean. But um, half these people that are winning, I haven't even heard of. They're not like really mainstream artists. And, and the way it's done now, from what I understand, is they have these, you know, t different teams of people that voting and, and they not really vote for what's really popular but what they like so it's kind of um i, I agree i don't even really yeah. tune into the grammys it's it's um it's not what it once was but um now moving on to for today we're also talking what i want to talk about today the interesting thing i came about up uh, uh, toys of the 1960s again i made a list here so <laughs> let's let's go down here okay i um it says they had plastic men, uh, men toys. So, so they had like remember little army men, cowboys and Indians. Um, Barbie was a big thing at the time. Electric ovens, plastic dishes. Now plastic dishes. That's where like little girls would want to. They'd have these ovens. They'd want to pretend like you know they were having a party at their house or serving people. Um, so that was real big. GI Joe, uh, GI Joe toys. GI Joe yeah. was the first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was very controversial because up until GI Joe came out. Only girls played with dolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and that's there good. was a big, big, uh, you know, uh, you know, flack, uh, you know, big yeah. societal push against. I mean, the world is GI Joe's at that time. The world was not the PC place it is today. I, I remember what you're saying. No son of mine is going to be playing with a doll. What is this? You know, <laughs> that was a big deal back then. Yeah, you know, and a lot of people don't know that. But yeah, when you know, GI Joe was a, a toy game changer. Yeah, uh, because I'll tell you, you know, the second GI Joes came out, I had to have one. 
Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, yeah. there was no delay in it whatsoever. I remember being a kid and seeing GI Joes on the toy shelf. Oh yeah, at the at the, um, at the store when my parents would be shopping. It just like being that kid. Go, oh my gosh, I want one of those so bad. Again, again, you GI know? Joe. I mean, uh, was big in the comics back then. It was like at one point they had a cartoon show on TV. I remember. Um, and then another thing that was big. You brought this up in the uh, first part of this um, last time we did this. Batman, they had a ton of Batman toys because, you know, especially around 1966 when the TV show came on, Batman was everywhere. Yeah, it was extremely popular. I told you yeah, yeah. in our last one how I got in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you might as well have stabbed me with a knife in my yeah. heart. Yeah. Uh, because taking away my ability to watch Batman, that was yeah. the worst thing that could ever happen. And I never played with matches ever again. Yeah. That, so that's amazing. It worked. There, it worked. There, yeah. It, it, it worked. And you know, okay, another thing was big at the time, talking toys, pull string toys. You get like, um, again, dolls or stuffed animals that you could pull and make a noise and talk to you or d different things like that, I remember. Um, well, the 60s was also kind of a, 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 a turning point because whenever somebody would come out with, okay, because electronics was brand new. New at the time, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, previous to that, no toys had the element of electricity yeah, yeah. or batteries and, and things yeah. of that nature. So um, the 60s is also a pivotal point where uh, battery toys and things like of Remote that control nature, cars and stuff, yeah. Yeah, were popping up, and, and, and those toys were extremely popular because, it, you know, it's basically the mentality of the public. If it had electricity, that meant it was brand new, cutting edge, and everybody wants it. Yeah, and now, um, and now another thing that was really big at the time, it says, was Disney toys. Now, you got you got to remember at the time, you know, um, I, I'm not even real sh sure if Disneyland was just a dream or just, but, you know, Walt Disney was big in the industry is just starting to really make his mark and i guess this is the point when somebody got the bright hey, hey you know what let's start um like having mickey mouse toys and you know um donald duck and the different characters i mean um it, it was part part of a way for them to kind of merchandise their stuff and i mean this even predates you know people say like gene simmons uh, um the way he marketed kiss and everything you got all the kiss dolls and every everything imaginable but this even really predates that and it just shows you that you take a popular character like Mickey Mouse and kind of just merchandise it, but even today, like I'm hearing, um, they're starting to close down like all the Disney stores, but they're still gonna have their merchandise. Oh, we're, you can still buy this stuff online. We're just not, the stores aren't working for us right now, so we're gonna close all that down. But we're still gonna have the merchandise. It's amazing that you know, all these years later, Disney still got their merchandise and it's as popular as ever. Well, you know, you're you're mentioning Gene Simmons, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, with the Kiss dolls, but actually in the '60s there were actually Beatles dolls. Yeah, yeah. So the, the and, Beatles you know, again so predates even all that. Before yeah. Kiss, yeah, you know, came out with dolls, there were you know there was a merchandising thing with with the Beatles too. Yeah. But it was all you know. I mean, so many so many toys that we take for granted nowadays. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Say like Play-Doh. Oh, yeah. Started in the '60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Hot Wheel cars Match, were yeah. like the '60s. Um, you know, it's Mr. Potato Head. Yeah, and that's been in the news. The that's been in the news recently. <laughs> Amazing. That, yeah. that yeah. game Twister, which also you know had a a backlash back in the '60s because uh, people associated it with uh, sexual car, wow. you know, connotations. Uh, were being associated to that game when it first came out. Yeah, you know? see, see, it, it takes <laughs> people are getting in like all these. You know, you got your butt in her face. It, it takes it takes that kind of a thing. It takes one going pretty, on yeah. in that game. It takes one person to ruin ruin a good thing. You know what I mean? Because uh, one person's mind went there. You know, maybe a couple people. It's like, oh, all of a sudden, you know, there's a backlash. And then and I, I was reading another uh, popular board game at the time was. Um, Candyland, and, and that's still around today. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. tell me if you remember this, because we were talking about Dennis the Menace, which was on TV at the time, you know, in the 60s. Um, it says there were a lot of Dennis the Menace toys. Do you remember that at the time? 
You know, I, I never really gravitated towards Dennis the Menace toys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but um, I, I do remember uh, going into... Uh, um, uh, back in the 60s, my parents uh, would uh, drive out to Palm Springs because yeah, yeah. they would have uh, these... Um, uh, you know, pools with mineral water, and I guess it was real popular with the older generation to go, you know, nowadays you have them at your home, it's a jacuzzi. Yeah, yeah. But back in those days, they didn't have jacuzzis, and you would drive out to Palm Springs to go to these mineral springs, Okay. and then the older uh, people in my family would, you know, sit in those hot, you know, it was basically a pool, yeah. you know, that was 100 degrees, just, or, or close to 100 degrees, just like a jacuzzi. And uh, it, but it was mineral water, and it was supposed to be good for you. But one of the stops that we always did when we were coming back yeah. was we would stop at a place called Hadley's. Okay. And it's it's no longer the old building. The old building is is still there yeah. when you're driving there. But you know, they moved it to a newer, and it's nothing like what it used to be back in the '60s. It was gigantic, and yeah. you would go inside there, and they would have dates and they would have sunflower seeds and they would just have all kinds of uh stuff that they would grow uh out there in the desert that, wow. that you could grow and make money off of wow. uh with with selling to the public but they would also sell ice creams wow. and they also had toys and it was the first time i ever saw a troll doll <laughs> wow wow Yep, and yeah. that was way back in the '60s, and yeah. that's what that's when Troll yeah. uh, first hit the markets, and and the whole thing was was because they were they were so ugly, they were cute. Yeah, and you know, like um, they they said another popular thing at the time because I guess um, Popeye Popeye the Sailor Man toys. Um, I remember as a kid too, um, going over to my grandmother's and saying she used to love to watch um, the Popeye Sailor Show. They used to have I remember on Channel Five out here in L.A. and they had this guy. Tom Haddon that would kind of host it and introduce the, the different cartoons and then um, he, he'd like draw different things, show you how to draw Popeye and that. It was just a fun little show. But um, uh -huh. what, what I bring that up because it's, it's, it's interesting. Like these toys, like Dennis, stuff they had for Disney and Dennis and Menace and um, it says Popeye the Sailor. Okay, these are all stuff that were really popular back in the 50s and the 60s still at the time. Now, like, like anything, they've got a period where they're really, really popular. Now, if you could find any of these like Popeye toys or even Dennis... They'd be worth something today, but they don't have the popularity they once did. They're a lot more like you're saying, retro now. People kind of have a fondness to look back on it. But people that weren't there at the time, they don't realize just because like Popeye the Sailor's not as popular, it's it was popular back then, you know? Oh, it was hugely popular. Yeah. You know, uh, they, uh, God, I, I, rock em, sock em. Yeah, yeah. It was the two robots that you would, you know, have. There was a red robot and a blue robot, and you would have them fight. Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole idea is to, you know, uh, you know, get that one good punch that would make his head go up. Yeah. That was real popular back in the '60s. Etch a sketch. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. You, you remember? Etch a sketch came from the '60s, yeah. and that's still around. Oh yeah, I mean, people are still buying that, and you know. Um, it also says, okay, the Flintstones, um, they had a lot of toys, uh, Flintstone-themed toys. I bring that up because the Flintstones, um, as we kind of, I don't know if we touched on, but I was reading um, when we did the last episode on this, that um, the Flintstones was the first, um, first like, TV family where they, they ever showed um, a man, you know, like Fred Flintstone and his wife Wilma, first time you'd see on a TV show where a man and wife were actually in the same bed together like we were kind of talking about um they could get away with it yeah. in a cartoon i guess yeah 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 i mean even like <laughs> in the brady bunch we were discussing you had mom and dad in the same bed but they had to be like on top of the covers and in their pajamas and and um but that was actually the first time they showed anything like that on tv was a flintstone it's kind of funny that they could get away with that such a popular show, God. When I was a kid, I yeah. was always glued to the TV to watch the Flintstones. In fact, so much so that you and me are going to have to do like a separate episode on that. But they, they obviously um, deserve a mention here. And then another thing, Bozo the Clown. Now, now that was pretty popular at the time. A lot of people listening to this may not even know anything about Bozo the Clown. But um, probably the first kind of most famous clown ever. Probably even predates uh, 
Ronald McDonald. Oh, he does, and he actually uh, is, uh, I guess, more late fifties, early sixties. Yeah, yeah. 60s. yeah, yeah. Uh, but as a as a young child, uh, I used to watch that show. I used there was two shows that were real popular. This is like early sixties. Early 60s. 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, two shows that I used to watch. Uh, one of them was Bozo the Clown. Yeah, and I was so young that I. I I couldn't pronounce his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would call him Hozo. Oh wow! <laughs> that was okay. that was how I would say. Yeah. I want a Hozo. Ho-zo. Wow, wow, yeah. And then the other show was Romper Room. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And those were the the two uh, really re- when I was really really super young. Uh, you know. Yeah, I remember I seeing old watch. episodes of Romper Room, and I, I dare say. Um, Best way to describe it, I'll just say it was a kitty type show, um, and it probably even predates Sesame Street. Oh, it's way before Sesame Street. Yeah, yeah, Street. yeah, yeah, and yeah. yeah, you know, and and the, you know that the lady on the show she would have like what was I guess a mirror that was actually missing the glass. Yeah, yeah, and she would look through it and say that she could and she would mention people's names you would write into the show and hopefully she would mention your name and if she mentioned your name it was like something oh my gosh she really does see me wow wow yeah 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 (laughs) and and, and, you know um another thing getting back to your point that you were making earlier um today about how electric toys are really the big thing like in the 60s it was a new thing I guess that's when um, they launched uh, Lionel Electric Trains. That that was really popular back back in the '60s. Yeah, anything that had electricity was new and cutting edge, mm-hmm. and that everybody wanted it. But there was another thing that was really popular uh, back in the. It was it was uh, called a Super Ball. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I remember those. Yeah. And uh, I remember, you know, I had to have one so bad. I remember one of the kids in the neighborhood had one, and you'd throw it on the ground, and the thing would bounce so high. Wow, yeah. It was, like, incredible how high that ball would bounce. And that was kind of the goal, to see how high. Immediately, I had to have it. And that's kind of the goal, is, like, see how, like, even some kids would have contests. Like, you'd say maybe you'd be outside with the neighbor kid, and um, you'd have one, and he'd have one, and you'd be like, you know, can you get it higher than me, or I'm going to get try to get it higher than you? That was the goal. And um, to kind of make my point here, um, there, there's one thing, though, here that I think really has had staying power. Um, I guess they launched this, like, in the 60s. Lego bricks, you know, and Lego sets. I mean, that's... Absolutely. That's all these years later, even. Um, it, it, it's a major thing kids still love to do. That's one thing that really has had staying power all these years. I mean, even if you go out to, like, downtown Disney... They have a Lego uh-huh. store. They have a Lego store. I mean, Legos are such a big well, deal. Well, there's even Lego Land now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's as big and as strong as ever. And yes, that all started back in the 60s when I was a little kid. So, yeah. you know, it, it's so funny to look back yeah, um, at these. how much... Uh, was you know in you know it was started and introduced to the you know public at that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know that you know some of these things are were so good they're still popular now. That's, I yeah. remember there was a uh, football game and it, you know it was. You know, you you put the football players on on this this board and everything like that. Yeah, it was yeah. one of those uh, you know first ever electric games, right? Yeah. And then um, you'd set up you know the one color on one side and you set them up on the other side, and then uh, to get them to move, you turned it on, and basically all there was underneath the floor was a vibrator. Oh wow, wow. <laughs> and so the men, you know, the men would run, move, but they would just go everywhere. There was no <laughs> there was no running plays, there was no this, yeah, yeah. no that. You just turned the thing on and the the thing the the you know, the players would just vibrate all over the place. Wow, wow. And <laughs> I remember <laughs> After that, you know, yeah. playing with that for a while, that, you know, that lost my interest pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, the final thing we're going to touch on here today that I've seen on this list was um, 
a toy that I still see around from time to time, Jack in the Box. Now, I, I kind of have always wondered, like, is this, if this Jack in the Box was originally based around, like, what came first, the Jack in the Box, the rest, you know, fast food restaurant we all know and love, or this, which is a thing, used to be like a wind-up toy. You'd wind it up and do 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 play like this, you know, kind of circus-type song. And then after, you know, it makes so many noises, it, this big this big clown, kind of scary-looking clown, pops up out of a Jack in the Box. But, um... I remember as a kid loving to do it, um, and I still see you know little kids doing it today. So again, it's it's one of those things that kind of stood the test of time. Interestingly enough, well, my granddaughter has one now. Wow! Uh, but it's Pete the Cat. Oh, okay. And it basically works exactly the same way. You turn the lever, and it just plays music, and then all of a sudden, Pete the Cat pops out. Interesting. You know, so. You know, we we I, I I was warning you that we weren't going to have enough time. But you know, to, we you know, we, but touched... we didn't even get a chance to talk about sixties uh, hippie fashion. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, my friend. Um, what, what we can do because there's a lot of um, and you know, and thinking of future episodes, there's a lot of a lot more to cover. So I don't know that we can um, get it all down in one episode, but like. Um, I was thinking, like, we can have, like, go back and have a, another discussion, like, on a future episode about, because there's so much to talk about, um, no matter if we're talking about the 60s, the 70s, or 80s, or whatever, but, um, you know, just to kind of wrap up today for what you were saying about the fashion, I mean, I mean, you know, we end the 60s in 1969, which is kind of where um, a lot of that Woodstock era music debuts at, of course, the Woodstock Festival, and... Um, and it's kind of funny that, um, you know, we have Woodstock at the end of 1969, um, and then um, th that, that era of music has really had staying power, and it affected everything, like you're saying, from tie-dyes and stuff. I mean, that is where all that originated. And, and um, I do definitely want to do a future episode on, on fashion and stuff. It's just a matter of trying to get it, get it all in. But I, I talked about um, the majority of stuff I want to talk about, which was the toys and the music. So we, we will definitely do that on a future episode, I promise you. Because um, I'm going to give you another website to check out later, Gar, that you should go check out. And there is everything on there. I mean, we could do episodes on technology and just major films. I mean, um, how excited are you to see the um, Godzilla vs. King Kong that comes out this week? You know, um, it's, it's, it's your classic story of good versus evil. Yeah, yeah. Because always, you know, uh, the way a long time ago, I think it was back in the 60s, they did yeah. Godzilla versus King Kong. Yeah, yeah. And of course, King Kong, everybody embraced King Kong yeah. as the good guy, and everybody looked at Godzilla as the bad guy. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know anything about how they're going to do this this new Godzilla versus King yeah. Kong, but yeah. I have a strong feeling that it's going to have that same uh, tie-in where where the public embraces King Kong, and uh, you know the villain is Godzilla. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I and it, yeah. it's, a, it's a classic story. It's a classic storyline, and just just like everybody, you know, everybody yeah. with the first time around when yeah. they did it, everybody was like in, behind King Kong, kick yeah. his <laughs> kick yeah, yeah. his butt, get yeah. him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and you know, I think um, I, I I agree with you because I mean, I'm seeing a lot of stuff where we're having a lot of merchandise to go along with the movie, and it's all it's all themed as that Kong versus Godzilla and this and that and it's like I, I don't know even what side I want to be on because I, I, like, I'm a fan of both and the reason I ask you um, before we wrap it up for today is I, I think um, I think that this deserves a, a future episode I, I don't know if you want to just do uh, like one on King Kong versus um, Godzilla we talked a little bit about the new movie maybe but I think I'd also like to do like one an episode on maybe King Kong because just King Kong alone has got a huge history and then I think devote an hour to God, Godzilla as well. Well, just like when we were, when we were talking about old movies, yeah. I, I went through a, fa uh, a pretty long phase uh, as a kid where uh, all I all I wanted to watch was black and white movies. Yeah, and I think you told me and King Kong was one, one of your all-time classic yeah. movies that was that was you know at the top of my list was King Kong. Okay, so yeah, we'll definitely. Um, um, we have a few more episodes planned um, next to you, and then um, 
maybe we can talk about uh, uh, doing an episode of, uh, on uh, King Kong and Godzilla. I think that would be a cool idea. Um, so Gar, once again, um, anybody listening, this is um, episode three, part two. We're doing on um, of, of Gar Borges' time machine. Thanks for tuning in, and um, and we will uh, we'll be checking back with you guys. Thanks for tuning in. We we appreciate. It. Anything else you'd like to say to your listeners, Gar? Well, I just, I just hope every, you know, for for the people that are younger that might listen to something like this, hopefully it just kind of opens up a uh, window uh, to, you know, some of these things to give you a little bit more of a, a backstory to everything. Yeah, yeah. And to all of the people that are uh, close to my age. Uh, hopefully that, you know, it, it, you know, it's really kind of warming their heart, uh, to, you know, li- you know, kind of relive, uh, a lot of these things that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and for me being able to touch on things that they might have experienced too, yeah. uh, to bring, gr- from, bring back some great old memories. So I hope, I, I just hope uh, from the bottom of my heart that that's, that's what I'm touching in people. And, uh, hopefully that's what everybody gets out of this. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think what's really working with this Gar is, um, like I was saying before, like when you, you and I have done this past stuff on, um, the, our favorite music and stuff, like, I think you could give a lesson in rock and roll, for example, cause you got such a passion for it. But this, this stuff as well, you know, talking to you about pop culture and TV and movies from that time, you, you have a real passion for it. So when you talk about it, like people listening to this, they can hear how excited you get just, it like it takes you back to when you were there. And that's why it's so great for a guy like me that um, wasn't even there for half the stuff, but I grew up after the fact, you know, and it still means something to me. So we got two different perspectives and I think that's what makes this work. <clears throat> well, you know, I, 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 all I can do is it's very enjoyable to do this and yeah. hopefully other people are getting or maybe it's transferring to other people. I, yeah, I, I really think what, hope yeah. that it is. I think what makes it fun to listen to is it's not the same thing every episode when you turn it in. It's, um, you know, we get, I'm um, just doing this today. I got other ideas. I'm going around my head for future episodes and you probably do as well. But um, I think that's what makes it fun. Each time that we do this, it's, different than the previous episode you don't want to uh, be like repeating yourself and i don't think we've done that yet <laughs> no no that, and that the way that's when i was doing original music that's yeah. exactly the way i looked at the music that i was writing and and everything i did i didn't want uh to do just another this song or another yeah, that yeah, i wanted yeah. everything to stand on its own well gar um you enjoy the rest of your weekend and i'll, I'll be um talking to you now um um check back in a few